Well, if you'll join with me in our opening words, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, I'm just delighted to see all of you here this morning and uh, continue to relish the day when we're fully back doing everything together uh, as a, a live community. But we uh, also want to welcome those who will be watching the service um, that we are taping today. I'm glad you're able to, to join in worship in that unique way. I know there are some visitors here uh, from Bay Area UU, so I want to welcome them and any other individuals who are welcome, uh, who are here for the first time. I uh, just want to say uh, we're glad you're here and that you can join in our service uh, of worship. Um, two announcements that are not in the bulletin. Uh, one is the liturgical arts class uh, is meeting today at 3 p.m. by Zoom. And then the second one is... Uh, on the second Sunday of February, February 13th, uh, there will be an early risers breakfast and a cake reception for Julie Stonebarger, um, who has completed her work here. And um, we wanted to take some time to honor uh, the, the dedicated service that she gave to uh, this congregation. There's one other announcement coming from Glenn. Uh, so Glenn, come on down. Good morning. Oh. I've been taught my whole life to project my voice. I would like to highlight this morning a wonderful musical opportunity that we have here at Webster Presbyterian. When you go to downtown Houston to see the symphony, the opera, the ballet, musical theater, there is an anticipation and an expectation as to the caliber of music you will experience. But what if you could simply drive over to WPC on a Sunday afternoon and hear the same quality of music. Well, you can. Of course, you already probably guessed that. Just before the pandemic took hold in 2020, we were working to establish ourselves as the Clear Lake home of the Caria String Quartet, an international ensemble. The members of the quartet hail from the U.S., Italy, and Uzbekistan. Their mission is to foster community through engaging chamber music experiences. Although their 1920 season was cut short due to the pandemic, the quartet is once again presenting thoughtful programming to the public. They have also found our hospitality and our sanctuary perfect for the hosting of their performances. The only hitch thus far has been the number of folks we've been able to put in the seats. We simply have to, make, have to provide bigger audiences to make this viable moving forward. Not only do I challenge you to come out next Sunday, January 30th at 3 p.m., but I also challenge you to bring at least one friend with you. Sunday's program is titled History, and it takes its inspiration from art, paintings that memorialize important moments or ideas in history. The music by Hildegard von Bingen, Saint-Saëns, and Prokofiev. The concert is free with suggested donations of $25 for adults and $10 for students. If that's too steep, please, please, please don't let that be a, a, the cost be a deterrent to your being here. They would rather have you here. Thank you. And by the way, they are very, very good. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, so, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Uh, let us worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. 
Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that his way may be known upon earth, his saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And all the people say, Amen. Poetry today was written in 1896, and it's called Two Kinds of People. I think it really speaks to our heart of what we're doing today with the ordination and installation of officers. Two Kinds of People. There are two kinds of people on earth today, just two kinds of people. No more, I say. Not the sinner or the saint for it's well understood that the good are half bad and the bad are half good. Not the rich and the poor, for to rate a man's wealth, you must first know the state of his conscience and health. Not the humble and proud, for in life's little span, who puts on vain airs is not counted a man. Not the happy and sad, for the swift flying years bring each man his laughter and each man his tears. No, the kinds of people on earth I mean are the people who lift and the people who lean. Wherever you go, you will find the earth's masses are always divided into just these two classes. And oddly enough, you will find two, I ween. Mean. There's only one lifter for the twenty who lean. In which class are you? Are you easing the load of overtaxed lifters who toil down the road? Or are you a leaner who lets others bear your portion of labor and worry and care? 
Lord, we know we need your forgiveness. Please help us to open ourselves to your will through whatever we do. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Mighty and merciful God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we have not lived up to our calling. We have been timid and frightened disciples, forgetful of your powerful presence and the strength of your spirit among us. O oh God, forgive our foolish and sinful ways as you have chosen us and claimed us in our baptisms. Strengthen us anew to choose Christ's way in this world. Give us your Holy Spirit that each one in ministry may be provided with all the gifts of grace needed to fulfill our common calling through Jesus Christ our Lord, Savior. Amen. for forgiving all we do. brings joy to all. Share that peace with one another with a wave or a smile. For those at home or for when you leave here and go home, I encourage you to share the peace with others through texts, Facebook posts, phone calls, emails, or in person so all may know of God's forgiveness and peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Will the children that are here with us today come down and sit right here? Yay! Children today! Yeah. 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 I'm sorry that you have to look at my little face again. Uh, Vicki Smith has COVID and is not released yet to be with us. I'm going to read all of us something from the Bible, and this part's going to make sense, but then it's going to get into stuff that doesn't make sense, and I'm going to let you folks help me figure it out, okay? I know we can do it. Here it comes from 1 Corinthians. A person's body is one thing, but it has many parts. There are many parts to a body, but they all only make one body. Two ears, one nose, two eyes, two legs, two feet, but they only make one thing. If the whole body were an eye, 
the body would not be able to hear. If the whole body were an ear, the body would not be able to smell anything, right? If each part of the body were exactly the same, it wouldn't really be a body, okay? But God put the parts in the body as he wanted them. He made a place for eyes. He made a place for ears. He made a place for shoulders. Lots of parts. One body. Did that make sense? That part made sense, right? Here's the part that doesn't make sense. The church is the body of Christ. Hmm. The church is the body of Christ. So here's what I need you to do. Think of something you do really, really well, okay? And when I come to you, I want you to say it loud enough so that they can hear it, okay? What do you do? Really do. Ooh, she is a good, he's a good racer. Okay, how about you, And she runs even faster than he does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and what do you do? Ooh, he makes crafts. Oh, good. An artist in our midst. I love that. And what do you do? Dance. Oh, my goodness. We have runners. We have craft makers. We have dancers. Well, and racers. Absolutely. Well, let's, today, we're going to have some people in this church that have been called to do a special gift. So I would like all of those people today that are going to be ordained and installed, all of our new officers of the church, please stand up. And we're going to see if these kiddos can figure out why you were called. No, no, no. We're going to look over. Your grandpa is standing. Okay, so why do you think Papa was chosen to be a special person in this church? What does he do really well? <gasps> he cooks, he makes breakfast. And he knows how to go to the grocery store. (laughs) Yay. All right. Anybody else that you see that you know? Oh, they're not standing up. Well, I see two people standing in the choir. I wonder if God chose them because they are good singers. Hmm. Hmm. And I see somebody else that cooks breakfast for us. There you go. Maybe Ed Toby has been chosen because he also knows how to make good breakfast. And I see that Miss Jamie in the front, I know that she is a counselor. She talks to people and makes them feel better. And she takes care of her mom and brings her to church. That's an important job, isn't it? Very good. And I see, oh, There's Doug McCann. I know he tells great stories and jokes. Maybe that's why God picked him to lead us. What do you think? So everybody look around and see those people that are going to lead our church. I also think, and I don't see them today, we should have had two teenagers to stand up. Hmm. I know that, that God chose Aaliyah Bagaris and Walker Strawn to also lead the church because they are young people that will also lead the church in their special way. Okay? Excellent. All right. Stay standing. We, we've got one more thing we've got to do. Later on in the service... Reverend Keith and Reverend Dan are going to ask them some questions to make sure that they're really ready to lead this church. And everyone here is going to promise to help them make the church strong. We call this the laying on of hands. And you boys and girls can do this too. 
reach out as if you were going to touch one of those people that's standing up. And we're going to say, let God be with you as you lead this church. I will follow where you lead. And they will feel the Spirit of God connect us into one body of Christ, the church. It is really, really cool. So if you friends stay in the sanctuary today, you'll get to do it too. But now, let's just pretend. Let's just pretend. Let God be with you as you lead this church, and I will follow where you lead. Thank you. You may be seated. And now, let us pray. Join me. Dear God, thank you for making me special. Thank you for letting me be a part of your body. Thank you for letting me be a part of your body. I will help you make this church strong. I will help you make this church strong. Amen. It's good to have the young ones here uh, today. Our first uh, Bible text comes from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it's chapter 4, reading verses 14 through 21. Uh, before I read it, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we invite your spirit to enlighten us, uh, not only in this moment, but in all moments. We also give you thanks that we have what we call the Bible, um, the experience of the people of God who have gone before us, who have passed on their wisdom to us. We also thank you for the opportunities we have to uh, gather one with another and try to make sense of what this uh, thing we call the Bible um, has for us in the way we live our lives today. Uh, and so we, we pray for illumination. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name and the people all together say amen. These are two simple texts, um, uh, but important texts. Uh, you, you should recognize both of them. Uh, this one from chapter four, 4 in the Gospel of Luke is uh, when Jesus gives his first sermon uh, which was among his own people and uh, didn't go very well for him um, or for the people. We'll leave that for another day and just get at the core of what he was trying to communicate. So it says, Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him uh, spread through all of the surrounding countryside. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Now, when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. As was his custom, he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all uh, were in the synagogue were on him. Then he began to say today to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, thanks be to God.
Thank you for that delightful anthem. Our second lesson today is taken from Psalm 19, and uh, it really al aligns well with uh, what Jesus was doing. Um, I'm learning uh, this morning that the letters in my Bible seem to be getting smaller, <laughs> uh, so hopefully I can read it. Um, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet the voice goes out through all the earth, and, they, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding, uh, from his wedding canopy, and like the strong man, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit is to the end of them, and nothing is hid uh, from its heat. And then it shifts to the Bible itself and says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, commanding, I mean, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteousness altogether. Uh, more to be desired are they than gold, even much gold, sweeter also than honey and dripping of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from its hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from insolence. Do not let them have a dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. And then these well-known words, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my God, my rock, and my redeemer. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to keep this very, very simple today. Um, since we are ordaining and installing elders and deacons, and uh, we have a trustee here today, uh, I'd like to say this one thing to the new officers. Um, to be a really strong leader in the church, your faith has to be strong. You get asked to do different tasks and could be helping with the finances or fixing the toilets or any number of things. It could be a cook. All of those tasks are important. But your primary witness as an elder or a deacon or a trustee should be what kind of Christ do people see in the way you live? Uh, do people see the, the heart of Jesus uh, emanating from who you are? Uh, do people hear out of your lips the kind of things that are appropriate uh, to be a leader as well as a follower of Jesus? So I would say to you as you begin this new adventure, uh, let me invite you to make a three-year commitment to do one single thing, which is to deploy your life energies to become uh, a wiser and uh, a more dedicated follower of Jesus. What attracts people to the church really isn't um, a youth program or a music program, 
what attracts people to churches or the people and the kind of attitudes and ways of life they inhabit. And so I have to say it one more time, those of you who are new this time to be an elders and deacons, use this next three years well and try to, to take into your heart what the Bible often says, hunger for wisdom. Now, in talking about this text, I'm reminded of something significant um, from John Calvin, who founded, uh, the, he was a reformer of the Catholic Church in, in Switzerland, and he's the one that coined the phrase that Presbyterians love. Uh, Presbyterians, I'm putting that word in his mouth, Presbyterians serve God well by using our minds well. One of the things that's always attracted me to being part of this particular tradition is the commitment to wisdom not just about the Bible, but about all things in life. It's the using your mind as a servant to bring what you learn uh, to bear to allow life around you to flourish. Presbyterians almost always have served God best by using their minds well. And I want to commend that to you and then remind you uh, of several things that are here in our text. Uh, one of them is, it says that Jesus was filled with the Spirit. If you read the prophets very much, you'll see that all of the prophets have that phrase attached to them. The Spirit of the God was upon them. Well, what spirit are we talking about? Well, let me give it to it as a simple way as I can think of. My mom used to listen to one news program 24-7 in the latter part of her life. She had the same program, same t channel on, three TVs running 24-7. And um, she got the spirit that came out of what she was listening to. In a like manner, whatever we are spending most of our time seeing and listening to, that's inhabiting us. Um, but Jesus communicates and, and has a history of his own life is the Spirit of God that emerges from engaging with others on what the meaning of the sacred texts are about. It's hard to do a church well, for example, if people spend very little time with the gift we have called the Bible. And more importantly, it's hard to be a church very well if people do read the Bible on their own but they don't do the second most important thing we're supposed to do with the Bible, which is to sit with others and have conversations about God, about what it means to be a human being, and about what God wants us to do and how God wants us to be. So if you're coming on as a new elder or deacon, uh, I want to encourage you to find a new church home within this, this group, a, a small group. We have plenty of them and plant yourself there for three years and enjoy what happens. Catch the Spirit of God in the conversations of the people that you're with. Second thing we see here is that uh, Jesus went to the Sabbath as was his custom. Jesus was a very devout person as was Mary and Joseph. I don't know what people think worship's about, but I think it's at, at the very least, it's this. It's a little bit like uh, climbing the highest tree in the forest uh, on a Sunday and looking around and getting your bearings right so that you go back down the tree and you live in the forest uh, being influenced by that light you got from going up high. Uh, worship is about keeping us centered, keeping us ordered, keeping us committed and so the second thing I want to encourage those new officers to do is to make sure that you copy Jesus and make it your practice to be at worship uh, either here or somewhere else on vacation if you can. It's an important kind of witness. The third thing we see about this is that Jesus was a teacher. Jesus was a healer. Jesus was a prophet. Uh, Jesus was a priest. 
But Jesus primarily, in my mind, was a teacher. And so the question I would offer from this is people sat in front of him while he would teach. And I want you to think about the people. What you learn is they were teachable. They were teachable. John Calvin, in talking about his conversion, explicitly said nothing dramatic happened to him. The only thing that happened to him is he suddenly became more teachable. And my question to anybody in this room, especially the new officers, is are you still teachable? Are you still teachable? Wisdom comes over time, over a lifetime. And one way to be just alive in Christ is to be teachable and to look forward to being around other people who yearn to be teachable. We love God well by using our minds well. Then it says, um, today, after reading from Isaiah, uh, the word has been uh, fulfilled in my name. Well, what is being fulfilled? One, Jesus' favorite biblical teacher was Isaiah. He quoted Isaiah constantly. His teacher or mentor was the biblical character. Who is your primary teacher these days in the faith? But he picked it up and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's weighing on me. This is what I think God wants me to do. And he thinks he's anointed, meaning that he has oil placed on his head that He's going to dedicate his life energies to being a teacher of the faith. And then it says, because I'm to, I'm to be a preacher of good news to poor people and people who are poor in the spirit. I'm going to proclaim release from anyone who is in any kind of bondage so that they might be free again. I'm going to recover the sight of the blind and of the spiritual blind. I'm going to let those who are oppressed by others go free. And then I'm going to proclaim the year of jubilee when people who were in bondage to massive debt were set free. What Jesus was doing is simply saying, here is how I, as a person of faith, Hearing God's word speaking to me, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Now, if you read the study of the Gospel of Luke, you would see that this little section is like the topic sentence, and the rest of the Gospel of the New Testament of of Luke is nothing but story after story of him embodying what he had read, embodying what he had seen. There's the old thing preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. He preached by the quality of his life. And so we have there, right there in front of us, the one named Jesus who we are to imitate and emulate. And when we do that, the Spirit of God is upon us, working through us. And then we're privileged to do beautiful things for God. When you get over to Psalm 19... You can pick two more important things about uh, being teachable. At the very beginning, um, there's a conversation about God's creation. And then the second part is about the Bible itself. John Calvin said that everyone who would walk in the way of Jesus needs to study two books. Two books, not one, but two books. The first book is the book of nature that nature is just replete with creative energy and, and just so many things could happen to people in terms of enriching uh, their faith. You know, it's, it's, it's go out and play in nature again. Um, I recently had a little experience of that because of the pandemic. I was watching a little bit too much TV and, um, and I was not feeling very great as a consequence. And so... My wife, the smart lady, said, well, go for a walk. And so I started walking every day. And, um, man, it's, when, you, when you have eyes to see, it's amazing uh, what's out there. And it brings uh, joy and healing to the soul uh, to 
find yourself as just one more creature in the great created world in which we live in. But then it also says that we, Calvin said, we also need to read the Bible. And he even gives us some uh, consequences of it. And I think these consequences are true. When people gather and they take a Bible passage apart or something else that's about faith, the conversations are almost always interesting. And you do and can find a revival of your soul. You can find some, some, new, some new wisdom that, that's really helpful to you. You, 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 you can find that, that your uh, direction for life is getting clearer. But one of the great benefits of Bible study is this notion of revival of the soul. It also provides an opportunity, uh, tools, if you will, uh, uh, to grow in wisdom about life, about God, and about the relationship of all of us to the created world and to God. It says that, that working with the scriptures can rejoice the heart. I've started teaching my first Bible classes in 1973, and I've been teaching or leading, really, a Bible study um, ever since. It's my own conviction that the strength of any congregation is determined by how many people are gathering in small groups to have conversations about what the sacred text means. The fewer people doing it, the weaker the church. The more people doing it, the church is almost always flourishing. Uh, and it brings rejoicing when you see that. And it says, when you study the Bible, your eyes are enlightened. You just see new stuff. You are, are, are uh, being called to attention to things that have not been in the front of your mind. But either way, uh, we are all called as Presbyterians to serve God well by using our minds well. We are also called through the witness of Jesus to make it our practice to be at Sabbath or worship. It, he calls us to not only study these words, but to inhabit these words to allow ourselves, our life energies, to be used for all that God has in mind and to become all that God intends for us to be. And we're encouraged through these two texts to read the two books, the Bible that is nature and the Bible that is print. And between those two practices, along with the others I mentioned, it's very possible that we will continue to grow in grace and in particular in terms of wisdom. So for those new folks, this is my invitation to you to make a three-year commitment um, to walking deeper into the way of Jesus. That would be a perfect kind of witness for your leadership. With that in mind, let us have a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the gift of uh, of a congregation inviting us to stand for leadership. We thank you that we live in a community of faith that welcomes men and women and youth into leadership. We recognize that there are many tasks in the church, but we also recognize that uh, the church in America needs revival, and we pray that in our own lives we might be part of a new revival of faith simply by dedicating ourselves to uh, spending time with you in word and deed. Uh, we pray for the well-being of this congregation, even as we pray for the well-being of all congregations around who have people who are dedicated to a rich and high form of living. We pray in this room for Jesus, who is our Lord, as well as our Savior, and all the people together say, Amen. Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If any of you here today are interested in learning more about our church, church membership, church faith, 
Please speak to one of the pastors, elders, or ushers at the end of the service. If you are watching via video and are interested, please contact our church office using the information on the screen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in the triune God, God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. To me, all three are needed to celebrate the amazing God we honor and love. Jesus has taught me how to live, given me a way to live and process things if I only listen follow the instruction manual of the Bible. While doing all this, I will live my life and work to better the lives of others in the circles I live in, family, friends, church, and society as a whole. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray for all who work in business and industry, who work in homemaking, who work in medicine, who work in education, who work in agriculture, who work in government, who work in service to others, who are beginning a new career, who struggle in their work, who struggle to discern your calling, who seek new or different jobs, who are retired or anticipating retirement, who are unemployed or underemployed, whose work is not valued or appreciated, and those who are overcommitted. Give us joy in our work joy in using gifts and talents we receive from you. Lord God, we pray that you will give us joy in doing all our work to your honor and glory. We ask that you would equip us to labor in ways that promote justice and peace, that we would be equipped to be ministers of your peace in a world that cries for peace. Lord, for all those who are ill, all those who are incarcerated, hospitalized, folks suffering, suffering from physical illness, spiritual, mental, and emotional, all these issues, Lord, we ask your healing touch. Lord God, we take a moment to lift up to you the ones we love most and are most concerned about, whom you already know, we lift them to you anyway. Lord God, you love us as your own children, and it is in the gracious name of Christ that we pray this. Amen. So the, the slate of new officers, I want to read off their names. And if you're here today, please stand so that everybody gets a good look at you. They may not know who you are. Trustee James Doug McCann. Elder Jeanette Bohr. Well, Al Strand, Strand did not make it, and Walker Strand did not make it. Walker will be our youth elder this uh, next time. Ed Tobia Elder. Elder Jamie Wilson, Elder Tamar Wasoyan, our youth deacon Aliyah Begaris is not here, 
Deacon Erica Lopez is not here. Deacon Sandy Dwyer is here. Deacon Cynthia Floyd is out of town. Deacon Priscilla Pat Kester. Deacon Sandy Murphy and Deacon Evelyn Timmons. Did I see Evelyn? No, I guess she didn't make it this morning. Okay, you may, most of you may be seated. Those of you who are new and need to be installed and or ordained, please remain standing. Instead of having you all come up here today like we would normally do, have you stand up here in front of everybody with Omicron running around, we're just going to have you stand where you are today. We'll do laying of hands a little bit differently also. So, y'all follow along in your bulletin, please, responsively. This is the calling of the church. The church is the body of Christ. Christ gives to the church all the gifts necessary to be, whole, to be his body. The church strives to demonstrate these gifts in its life as a community in the world. The church is to be a community of faith, entrusting itself to God alone, even at the risk of losing its life. The church is to be a community of hope, rejoicing in the sure and certain knowledge that in Christ, God is making a new creation. The church is to be a community of love, where sin is forgiven, reconciliation is accomplished, and the divine walls of hostility are torn down. The church is to be a community of witness, pointing beyond itself through word and work to the good news of God's transforming grace in Christ Jesus, its Lord. With all Christians of the church Catholic, we affirm that the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic, Catholic meaning universal. Where Christ is, there is the true church. We affirm that in the power of the spirit, the church is faithful to the mission of Christ as it proclaims and hears the word of God, administers and receives the sacraments, and nurtures a covenant community of disciples of Christ. The great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants to our servant, the Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, and as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church, and for the preaching of the word and the celebration of the sacraments. Thank you. 
If the rest of you would please stand as we say our profession of faith. As God calls some to particular forms of ministry, God calls us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing all that oppresses God and God's rule, and affirming the faith of the Holy Catholic Church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, please say, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, please say, I do. I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please say, I will, with God's help. I will, with God's help. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God the Father? If so, please say, we do. We do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? And do you believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. If so, please say we do. We do. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. If so, please say, we do, and amen. We do. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you. Also to you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right, right to give our thanks and praise. praise. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. We praise you for leading your people Israel through the waters of the sea, out of bondage, and into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you for pouring out your Holy Spirit who teaches us and leads us unto all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice that you have claimed us in our baptism and anointed us for service in Christ's name and that by your grace we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit renew us that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the life of the risen Christ to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, God, be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen. To the congregation, do we, the members of the church, accept these new ruling elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we agree to pray for them 
to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. To the elders and deacons, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, please say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, please say, I do. This is for the elders and the deacons. <clears throat> Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, please say, I do. Please say, I do. Ah, that's better. Thank you. Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, please say, I do. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to further peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, please say, I do. For the ruling elders. Will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. For the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. Now, if you new elders would stand once again. As I said, we are not going to bring them up and then have all the ordained folks come up and put their hands on them, you know, laying on of hands. But what I would like you to do, all the ordained people, just reach out towards them. God will make the connection. The Holy Spirit will move. The laying on of hands takes place so that we are asking God to pour out the Holy Spirit on those who will be ordained. This is an age-old tradition. And some people find when we are able, even maybe today, that there is something occurring. Thank you. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Eternal God, we give you thanks for the steadfast faithfulness in every age. You have called forth leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Among your people Israel, you anointed prophets, priests, and rulers. You called pastors, teachers, bishops, elders, and deacons 
to build up your church. With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, deacons, elders, and pastors served together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. For the deacons. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit that they may be faithful deacons in the church. Give them openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that they may see and serve wherever there is need. Train them in the school of prayer, that they may express the compassion of Christ for the poor and the friendless, the sick, the grieving, and the troubled. Equip them with courage to bear the gospel into the halls of power and to communicate your presence and might among those who are powerless. In everything, give them the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of your reign. Give them joy in the walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for the work of ministry. For the ruling elders, gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on Jeanette, Carol, and Tamar, that they may be your faithful elders in the church. Give them prudence and sound judgment, wisdom and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish them in the life of the Holy Spirit that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion. Guide them in governance on this session and in every court of the church that they may be servant leaders following Christ who came not to serve but to be served. Not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Give them joy in the walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for the work of ministry. And in the unity of his spirit, may we proclaim good news, make disciples be light and leaven, share our bread, <clears throat> offer a cup of cold water, Wash one another's feet, make us strong in Christ to live as your people, and show forth your saving love in the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. And together we say, Amen. Jeanette and Tamar, you are deacons and ruling elders ordained to ministries of service and governance in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. We welcome you to the community of faith as a servant. We welcome you and look forward to seeing your service and your leadership in our church. So the charge to the newly ordained and installed from Matthew, come to me all you that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and you will learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For the congregation, your charge from 1 Peter, above all, maintain constant love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. 
Amen. Our words for stewardship comes from 1 Corinthians. Uh, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. May we remember that all the gifts, uh, all have gifts given to give to the church, which includes money and time and talent. I again, want to continue to say this church, this is the most generous church I've ever been in. So thanks be to God for um, the stewardship.
God of all wisdom and truth, we offer you our lives, our gifts, all our talent, all our treasure. We entrust to your care those who teach and learn and all who devote themselves to the work of formation. Teachers, students, staff and administrators, parents and children. Make us faithful disciples and shape us for your service through the Lord Jesus Christ, our teacher and our friend. Amen. And now we continue with the prayer that our friend Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Humbly, speak often, don't waste your words. Speak passionately, but speak faithfully. Speak the truth and speak it in love. Speak, but don't forget to listen.
serve the Lord.